Dr. Jaffe received his BS, MD, and PhD from the Boston University uh, School of Medicine. He completed his residency training in clinical chemistry at the National Institutes of Health and remained on the permanent uh, senior staff before pursuing other interests, including starting the Health Studies Collegium, Think Tank, and the Mac Geek Biotherapeutics. He is the founder of Perk Integrative Health, LLC, a company that offers the world scientifically proven integrative health solutions that speed the transition from sick care to healthful caring. Um, Dr. Jaffe is board certified in clinical pathology and in chemical pathology and the recipient of the Merck Sharp and Dome Excellence in Research Award, the J.D. Lane Award, and the USPHS Meritorious Service Award. Russ Jaffe has served 40 plus years of experience uh, contributing to the molecular biology and clinical diagnostics and has pioneered lymphocyte testing of immune function uh, designed to improve the precision of both diagnosis and treatment services. Uh, it also uh, was happy to report at the board meeting the other night that uh, Dr. Jaffe is going to be taking on very imminently the Clifford materials reactivity testing uh, so that those of us who've used that service for the last 34 years, it's not lost. Dr. Jaffe is probably the only guy in the country who can actually pull this off. So please give a warm academy welcome to Dr. Russ Jaffe. Thank you. It is good to be back. I come in peace. Um, there's a disclaimer, um, but my disclaimer is going to be after the first slide, you see the first slide, because we're going to cover Within biological dentistry, we're going to cover host hospitality and immune responses and wound healing. So I'll be talking about that, but I will also be dedicating this presentation to the memory of Jess Clifford and the Clifford family. And as Rich said, we will very soon, you can even sign up and we'll send you some kits, very soon be offering the Clifford method of dental compatibility along with our LRA by ELISA Act. And we think they're a very compatible group if you want to have better outcomes and lower complications. So the uh, disclaimer <clears throat> is that I maintain a fellow status in a half a dozen different medical societies. I'm a senior fellow of Health Studies Collegium, which is a foundation designed to study personalized, integrative, comprehensive, holistic approaches and their evidence. I am founder and part owner of Perk Integrative Health, Eliza Act Biotechnologies, and RMJ HRX. You can uh, reach me uh, by email at rjaffe at 4hsc.org, or better yet, at drrusselljaffe.com, where, where we are posting two new videos a week. We have hundreds up there. They're all topically organized. Hopefully, you'll come by and find them worthwhile. So the disclosure is that I have a conflict, which is I make my livelihood by serving you folks. Now, this presentation on immune defense and repair about the system functions of immune defense and repair for good or for ill. How many of you have heard about cytokine storm? Anyone who didn't put their hand up probably is asleep. We've all heard about cytokine storm. I'm going to demystify it for you and explain why you can avoid it and you shouldn't have it. In regard to host hospitality and vulnerability or susceptibility to infection after wounds, it's about a lack of healthy wound healing. When we have enough of the good and not too much of the bad, our immune defense and repair system, which has multiple levels and much capacity, repairs us without difficulty. And trauma, which often brings people to your offices, can be thought of, you can think of trauma, as a kind of wound. And so when I talk about wound healing, I am, of course, talking about connective tissue and healing tissue and um, 
margins coming together and all of that, but I'm also talking about the fact that very often people embed experience or trauma in their physical reality. And so they bring to you an issue, a dental issue, but they're a whole person. And one of the areas that I think is most relevant for you folks, and it may be familiar to you, but if it is, it's because you've heard us before, and we have much more information to share today than we did last time I was here. Because if you see the third bullet on this slide, inflammation is really repair deficit. Now, I am a doubly board certified pathologist, and I can say inflammation or the five subtypes of inflammation in three different languages, Latin, Yiddish, and English. But what you might have learned from our pathology colleagues, or even clinical colleagues, is that inflammation is a fire to be fought and, I'm, and suppressed. And I'm telling you that's not true. Inflammation is an opportunity to understand the deficit in repair, which comes out to be too little good and too much bad. So stay tuned, because I'm going to tell you what is good and what is bad and how to know the difference. Now then there are toxic and immune toxic effects of heavy metals, environmental chemicals, additives and excipients and their burden on the immune defense and repair system. And as Rich correctly said, it's been a mere 35 years that we have been in this territory starting with a hypothesis that we put to rigorous tests, outcome studies in fibromyalgia, most successful outcome study in type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And each study six months long because you need six months to get clear trending data or better yet, statistical significance. And I'm glad to tell you that even though we only studied a few people in each the control and the experimental group, every study was significant at below the 0.05 level. Now, for those of you who are not mathematically inclined to statistics, what that means is the fewer people you need to achieve mathematical significance, the more meaningful are the results. There's a reason why most pharmaceutical trials, such as the trials going on with new vaccines, enroll 40,000 people. Because the placebo effect is about one-third. And the efficacy is about a percent or two above that. So if you could, please use the placebo effect, which, by the way, is actually the human healing response. So I do occasionally use the word placebo, but I always qualify it by saying, you know, I really mean the human healing response, and I want to evoke it and not suppress it. So we decided in the early 80s, after I left government service, we decided to open up the box of the immune system and personalize functional immunology. And by functional healing or functional immunology, I basically mean food chemical sensitivity testing, but based on cell response, not on serum, not on antibodies, but measuring and culturing B cells and T cells. If you're familiar with the leaky gut or microbiome, it's about epigenetic lifestyle ills. These are habits that can be changed, usually not overnight, but yes, they can improve. The third bullet is that chronic repair deficit or autoimmune illness is of course enhanced in proportion to the total toxic chemical load. And then amplified by essential mineral and other nutrient deficits. So the bad are the toxins, both physical and immunologic. The good are the essentials. Now, when we use the essential before a word in nutrition, what we mean is your body can't make it. You've got to take it in from the outside. And for a lot of reasons, most people, and I know this is going to shock you, but for a lot of reasons, a lot of people today do not have a healthy digestive tract. And by the way, I used to talk about digestion, and now I talk about the microbiome. I used to talk about metabolism, and now I talk about the metabolome. I believe you have more cachet if you say microbiome and metabolome. Now, the fifth bullet says that comprehensive detoxification and immune repair go hand in hand. We are big fans of safer detoxification, what you could call biological detoxification. It is about what each of us eats and drinks, what we think and do, eat, drink, think, do. 
So we want to nourish immune defense and repair systems with personalized, proactive, predictive, primary prevention practice protocols. If you like onomatopoeia, that was seven Ps in a row. <laughs> now, when we talk about autoimmune-related conditions, ARDA, autoimmune-related conditions, it afflicts at least 50 million Americans. 80% by diagnosis are women, but it turns out if a woman comes in with an ache or a pain, it's more likely to be considered autoimmune, and if a man comes in with an ache or a pain, it's more likely to be considered a myoskeletal pain. So I'm, I'm not sure that that 80% is, I know that 80% is widely reported, um, but I think both men and women are afflicted. I think men are less willing to be forthright I think women are much more accessible, and I, I hope you all know this, but 75% of what is done in regard to health care in families and in relationships is done by the women for the people they love. And too often they will sacrifice themselves for the people they love. That's another subject for another time. So if you look at the Venn diagram, those circles with colors, Toxic chemicals play a role, dietary components play a role, infections or infectious risk, the immune defense and repair competence, your background genetics and epigenetics, and they all overlap. When they all overlap, you have in the middle autoimmune, self-attacking disease. On the bottom, you see the message. We have lost tolerance. I want us all to be very tolerant. I want us to be tolerantly, immunologically tolerant, intellectually tolerant. It turns out if you have a significant repair deficit, your brain, both your central nervous system and your gut nervous system will be less tolerant. Isn't that interesting? That everything is connected with everything else. And on most of the slides you will see a reference or two from the peer reviewed literature, some of them ours, many of them others, in support of the premise. So when we talk about the innate immune system, we're talking about the skin, nose, mouth, lungs, GI tract, all of the mucosal surfaces. And for all you have learned in the last year about mucosal respiratory viruses, how many people spoke about mucosal defense? How many people spoke about innate immune first line response? Because when you have enough secretory IgA, and obstinance and defensins on your mucosal surface, when you get exposed, not if, when you get exposed, it's neutralized at the mucosal surface. It is now, say, a foreign virus, an RNA virus, a mucosal virus, whatever. And if your secretory IgA, et cetera, is not adequate, you should have right below the surface billions of cells, white blood cells, wiggly white blood cells, granulocytic white blood cells, fibroblastic white blood cells, just waiting to gobble up anything foreign. In fact, one of the big problems with RNA viruses until very recently was they didn't know how to prevent the innate immune defense and repair system from eating up the vaccine and preventing a vaccine take. So we now have novel Excipients combine to become adjuvants. We may want to talk about what an adjuvant is and why without it the vaccine fails. And what the consequences, the biological costs, are from these adjuvants. So as you see in the lower right, healthier microbiomes repair, and they have NK, as in natural killer cell, anti-cancer, uh, capacities. So everyone in this room makes cancer cells every day. And when you have a healthy immune defense and repair system, when you're getting your restorative sleep, notice I said that you're getting restorative sleep, but when you're getting restorative sleep, signals come from the pineal to the pituitary, from the pituitary to the neurochemical immune system, and cells go out to surveil. They go out and touch every cell in the body. And if you have an abnormal cell, they are marked for apoptosis. It's spelled with a silent P but it's pronounced apoptosis, and it means programmed cell death. And without that, everybody would have cancer. And with that, nobody would have cancer. So cancer is clearly an environmental illness that was taught to me by the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute. 
So what we want to do is eliminate foreign invaders before they get in. We want to neutralize them and eliminate them before they get in. But if they do get in, then you have an adaptive immune system, which we're paying more attention to, because it turns out, especially for these RNA viruses of any fl uh, type and, and flavor, for the RNA viruses, your antibodies don't matter. Whether you have high or low antibodies doesn't tell you what you need to know. You need to know the T as in thymus, T cell response. T as in thymus, T cell response. For that, you need a cell culture. You can't do that on a serum test. So if you haven't seen yet, you will soon be seeing new generations of functional tests to measure T cell responses to vaccines. Just to say again, and, and to briefly s review, the adaptive immune system has two sides. It has a natural side and an artificial side. The natural side is passive protection. For example, when a baby is born, the mother's immune system protects the infant for about a year while the baby learns about the outside world and develops its own natural immune adaptive system. And then there are natural responses to active infection. If the infection gets in, then you should mobilize an adaptive response. The artificial side is not the same. When you infuse antibodies in response to an infection, that's passive transfer. It can be helpful. It can sometimes be life-saving. It can also induce autoimmunity. And then you have active artificial immune response, that's immunization. Now, for full disclosure, when I was a baby, I was vaccinated. But at that time, at that time, you only vaccinated well babies and you could defer the schedule and it was much more flexible and there weren't as many. I just saw a picture of how many vaccines a baby will get before the age of three today and it's quite impressive. It means that the innate immune defense and repair system is getting depressed, suppressed, is getting inhibited for several weeks after every visit to the pediatrician. If you do that once in a while, the body has amazing adaptive capacities. If you do that all the time, trouble you are brewing. So the message is we want to neutralize invaders before they get in. This has to do with choices about what you eat and drink, think and do. As I mentioned, but I do want to reinforce, there are 50 billion dendritic cells, white blood cells, to recycle 50 pathogens each. For those of you who remember, there used to be a test. It's still available. It's not very sexy, but it's very efficient. It's called phagocytic index. And when you measure phagocytic index in the lab, healthy white blood cells can take up 50 pathogens and recycle them. They put them in a lysosome recycling center in the cell, break it down to building blocks, amino acids, fats, and carbohydrates, and make use of it. This makes us inhospitable to disease. When, dis when dis-ease, when we lose ease and we develop illness, dis-ease is a sign of imbalance. When we have a healthy immune system, that ensures timely wound healings, delicate balance of cytokines, we'll get to that cytokine storm, chemokines, and growth factors. What we want is proactive repair from daily wear and tear, and we want to defend both skin and mucosa. It turns out your skin is the largest organ of your body, and it's more than a wrapper. And the mucosa does start at your lips, and go down into your lungs and through your digestive tract, except, and I offer this as their opinion, the Food and Drug Administration says that the mucosa starts at the stomach. And when a lawyer told me that, I said, I can bring 20 textbooks that will tell you that the mucosa starts at your lips and not in the, he says, it doesn't matter, it's their opinion. Okay, so I've given you their opinion and I've given you mine. What we want is a balance between defense and repair. We live in intoxicated times. We are marinating in a sea of anti-nutrient, pro-oxidative, harmful chemicals. What are you going to do about it? Because the, the what you do about it determines whether you can maintain a high level of quality in your life for life, for your entire lifespan, 
or whether you will be afflicted. Now, afflicted is, a, to me, it's a nice neutral word. Afflicted, if someone is suffering, they're afflicted. The Buddhists talk about affliction. They don't like to talk about harsh words. So we want a healthy defense and repair system where tolerance, resilience, and balance are provided. That's what our programs are designed to do. That's what we've delivered in our outcome studies. However, when you look at the epidemiological triad of environment, foreign agents, and host, it looks as if, as my grandmother used to say, the rents are going up and the ceilings are coming down. Sorry, that was meant to be a joke. <laughs> we want to increase host hospitality and susceptibility in ways that decrease the risk of disease. So the message here is illness is mostly a choice. It is only to a tiny extent genetic. It is almost all, as in 92 plus percent all, epigenetic, lifestyle. The choices you make every day about what you eat and drink, think and do. Here you see uh, peaches that we grow in our permaculture biodynamic food forest, poaching in some port wine with some cinnamon uh, cloves. Um, and I think there's a mushroom in there too. But anyway, uh, we have a, a now 10-year-old permaculture biodynamic food forest in our front yard. Come by and we'll feed you. And during the growing season, when we harvest little things, I try to take pictures and send them out to friends to encourage them to do what we've been doing. And I will tell you as an aside that the GSA, the General Services Administration, occasionally gets asked by someone in charge of a government building for edible landscaping or permaculture, and they bring them out to my house. Because they say that we have the most advanced combined permaculture biodynamic food forest east of the Mississippi. There is an older one in Bolinas, California at Common Wheel called RDI, Regenerative Design Institute. If you can, go pitch a tent there and you'll enjoy it. And now you see where most of us start, which is too much defense burden, too little repair, therefore a repair deficit. There is a critical need to tune up immune systems now. When I started this work, the immune system was a black box. When it worked properly, you were healthy. When it didn't, it attacked you. And the goal of medicine was to stop the attack with suppressive therapies. It seemed to me that by the early 80s, we should be able to open up that box and talk to the immune system and have it talk back to us. And if you talk about the immune system communication, you very quickly get to B-class and T-class lymphocytes, white blood cells. So we did something that hadn't been done before, take enzyme amplification, ELISA, the classic person in yellow amplification technique, ELISA, and marry it with advanced cell culture. That's why it's ELISA ACT, not just ELISA. And what that means is now we could get highly amplified, highly reproducible immune responses to foods, chemicals, medications, toxins. For example, we have the largest number of metals for which you can look at delayed hypersensitivity. The reason that we exist is because delayed allergies, delayed immune responses, delayed hypersensitivities are notoriously hard to find by history or by testing because it takes three hours to three weeks from exposure till you get the afflictive symptoms. Look up Arthur's reactions, look up Schwarzman reactions, look up serum sickness reactions. There's actually a very robust literature that says oy vey in many different languages. And the symptoms are often not specific and they often migrate. They drain your vitality. These are the people who come in and say to you, my get up and go got up and went, and I don't know, I can't find it anymore. <laughs> what we do is look at most of this pie, if you will, on the left. We measure reactive antibodies of any type or flavor, IgA, IgM, or IgG, but only reactive ones and not neutralizing beneficial protective ones, of which there are lots. 
and we measure immune complexes and T cell direct responses in a single mixed cell culture with high precision and with outcome studies that validate the hypothesis or the idea that hidden delayed allergies are both hard to find by history and serology, but by cell culture, ELISA ACT cell culture, LRA by ELISA ACT, you can. As you know, the immune system has an, uh, an intimate relationship with the digestive tract. About half of your whole immune defense and repair system is the lining of the intestines with immune component little nodes called Peyer's patches. And I'm old enough to have been taught that Peyer's patches are vestigial or vestigial if you're a professor um, because we didn't know what they did. And by the way, at the same time, the appendix and the tonsils were considered to be vestigial. And God bless my mother, she saved my tonsils and my appendix. It's a story for another time. I'm pretty much intact. And now we know that if you want to eat, say, meat, your appendix turns out to be very important. And if you want to protect the rest of your body, then it turns out your tonsils are very important. And if your tonsils are too large, gargling with a combination of nature's ascorbate, some zinc, and maybe some polyphenolics or some slippery elm, and you resolve the problem. So when you address the causes, which is what I'm recommending, you don't have to fight with the consequences. Now, a damaged intestinal lining, as you see on the right, has lost most of its surface capacity. If you take a healthy person's digestive tract and you stretch it out over a tennis court, it would actually stretch the entire area of the tennis court. Most of the people that you see in your practice mm, have a tenth of that. So they have enteropathy. They have atrophy of the digestive capacity. And so you may be putting the right things in, but they may not be able to take them up or absorb them. So leaky gut is a clinical, not a precise term, but it has to do with the fact that there are gap junctions, as you see on the bottom of the slide. And when toxins come in, the gap junctions should exclude them. The intestinal lining should be full of cells some of which are immune competent, some of which are just productive, because it turns out that the enterocytes, the cells that line your digestive tract, they need so much energy so fast that they get it from glutamine. And we pioneered recycled glutamine so that you could get the benefit of energizing and repair from glutamine without the risk of glutamate excitoneurotoxin formation. So you want the benefit of glutamine, but you don't want glutamate as excitoneurotoxin. And you want to restore what people had before. Most people that I talk to can tell me a point in time when they felt pretty well. Usually when they were a teenager or a young adult, they might have been young and immortal like most young people. But they can remember what it was like to feel and function well. Then there are the people who can never remember that. That's a different category, an interesting one, and, and as I'm sure you can imagine, if someone has a very simple, straightforward case of anything, I never hear about it. If you have a case that nobody else has ever figured out, that's when I might, might, might be helpful. So we have, in regard to the microbiome, essential prebiotic fiber, probiotic bugs, and recycled glutamine, the symbiotic recycled glutamine. And how much? And here I am channeling Dr. Dennis Burkett. You may know about him from Burkett's lymphoma, but he would tell the story that after he won the Nobel Prize, there were so many people who rang him up that he moved to Kenya and had no phone. <laughs> and he spent 20 years watching traditional and modern African society and concluded as you see on the slide, you need 40 to 100 grams of fiber a day from your diet. If you don't chew a lot, you're not getting enough. You need probiotic bugs, 40 to 100 billion, live bugs, CFU, colony forming units a day. And you need recycled glutamine to provide the energy to repair the enterocytes, one and a half grams on rising, one and a half grams before bed. And if you do exercise, you will be impressed or your clients will be impressed if they take a gram and a half of recycled glutamine half an hour before exercise. 
their peak performance will go up and their recovery time will go down. And I'm talking about people who know what their peak is and know what their recovery time is. And if you can shorten that recovery time, you're a hero. And if you improve their peak performance, they'll, they used to give you a hug, but I think now they just give you a high five. Then we get quickly to four self-assessments, four things that are very easy and inexpensive for people to do at home and bring the information back to you, like what is your GI transit time, your gastrointestinal transit time. This has to do with a lot of things, and as you see in the middle, a healthy digestive transit time is 12 to 18 hours. What you eat at night should come out in the morning. If it's less than 10 hours, you have short bowel syndrome. That's something we can help with, but that is a very serious problem. The average American today, when I made this slide, had a transit time, digestive transit time, of 36 to 96 hours. Way too long, plenty of time for bad stuff to happen in the colon and reabsorption of bad stuff and this and that. So you end up with not just chronic GI, gastrointestinal, but systemic illness. I think there are colleagues who um, advocate that it's all from your gut. All right, you, you can, I, I, I don't disagree with that, but I don't entirely agree with that. You can eat the perfect diet and still worry yourself uh, into illness. You can be very attentive to hydration, which we are big fans of, and still be taking in too much caffeine, too much alcohol, too much other things, so that you think you're hydrated, uh, but you're still a little dehydrated. And it turns out even 1% or 2% dehydrated, which is very, very common, is a very significant stress on your liver and spleen, on your gut and central nervous system, on your whole body. So we have these self-assessments that help people identify their personal issues and needs now it's all about me or all about them. It's no longer, oh, America has digestive problems, that's too bad. Oh, I have a digestive problem, now I'm concerned. Now what about the toxic metals linked to ill health? We know, going back to the work of Carl Pfeiffer and others, that there is a direct link between resistant chronic illness. There's chronic illness that responds promptly to good care, and then there's the chronic illness that despite good care, just indolently goes along. Very often, there are toxic metals involved, compounded by a lack of magnesium. We'll talk about that. And you can improve treatment success by assessing body burdens. And one way to assess the body burdens is the depenicillamine provocation. It's a three-day provocation. It doesn't require a 24-hour urine on the second day, but it gives you essential nutritional minerals and toxic minerals in one report. And it turns out if you have more lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, or nickel, you'll probably have less magnesium and zinc, and there's a reciprocal relationship between correcting the deficit in magnesium and zinc or other essential minerals and antioxidants and getting the toxic metals safely mobilized and out of the body. So we want you to be valued for your experience and results and not for your conventional uh, practice. Now there are many ways of doing provocation. As you see on this slide, we recommend the D-penicillamine. It's oral. The nice thing about D-penicillamine is it goes everywhere and then goes out of the body without being metabolized. So it is an amino acid. It's a sulfur-containing amino acid. So it goes into the brain and comes out of the brain. It doesn't deposit what it carries at the blood-brain barrier. It doesn't deposit the toxic metals in the kidney, as very often happens with DMPS, DMSA, and EDTA, or EGTA. So we did develop the D-penicillamine protocol. Uh, it is available in a consumer version as well as in a professional longer version, and we have the reference range for healthy people using the D-penicillamine provocation so you can compare your individual to healthy people's provocation. Now here's a lot of words on the slide, but hopefully you can come back and take a look at this. We summarize this biodetoxification and burden mitigation as the alkaline way. Life exists 
just on the alkaline side of neutral. So if seven is neutral, and it is arbitrarily neutral, if seven is neutral, life exists usually just on the alkaline side of neutral. When I was an intern in internal medicine, a patient came in with a pH of 6.87 arterial blood gas and survived, and I was briefly a hero. So you want to be alkaline, and this alkaline way goes back to a questionnaire that James Carter, of blessed memory, uh, helped validate that we worked with him on. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, was a big fan of biodetoxification. But did you know that, Hi that Hippocrates practiced on the island of Kos, not in Athens? Because the Athens Medical Society declared him a heretic. So he went to the island of Kos and became the father of, 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 of medicine. I mean, one of, one of, one of. In bold, you see about two-thirds down on the slide, testing for metabolic balance using pH of the first urine after rest. Turns out after six or more hours of rest, the urine, the fluid in the bladder, equilibrates with the bladder cells, and so you get a non-invasive measure of metabolic cellular acidosis, but only after rest the first urine. And I know you'd like to use saliva, but if you have anyone who has a healthy mouth and therefore has only saliva as opposed to serosanguineous fluid mixed in with their saliva, let me know. Because the National Institutes of Dental Research, NIDR, who I collaborated with when I was in government service, looked very carefully for healthy saliva, and what they came up with was called a Kirby cup. And some of you may know what this is. It's a little plastic disc that you put over the parotid gland, and there's a little tube that comes out of that into a collection tube that you put in your shirt. And you let the parotid saliva flow for about three hours. You can get a lot of people to do that once. <laughs> Hard to get people to do that twice. Dr. Frank Oppenheimer, a dentist from Switzerland, was studying that exact issue, the nature of the peptides in parotid saliva, so we all got very familiar with Kirby cups. But I will tell you, I don't ask people to do it. It's, just, it's a research procedure. If you're participating in a study and you have informed consent, God bless. So, we want to be pro-repair and pro-detoxification. And here we have six recommendations. The personal sea cleanse. So using nature's fully buffered, fully reduced ascorbate. You take a dose every 15 minutes until you cleanse or flush so that you know how much 100% L-ascorbate fully reduced and buffered you need on a daily basis. And it's about 3 quarters of what it takes to do the cleanse. So let's say it took 10 grams to do your cleanse. 7 and a half grams spread through the entire day is what you need until you do the next cleanse. Then polyphenolics, big fan of polyphenolics. This happens to be pomegranate because we have various versions of polyphenolics. We have coercin and dihydrate and soluble OPC, and then we have the same combination with evaporated pomegranate juice. But just as a quick story about how you need to be constantly vigilant in the supplement industry, we ordered this evaporated pomegranate juice high in ellagic acid, and what we received was clearly ground up pomegranate rind, which is very different. So we communicated with the source and they said, oh, you want the evaporated pomegranate juice that comes from juice? <laughs> yes, we do. Oh, we'll send that right out to you. And the box they sent was empty. And we called them up or communicated again, and they said, oh, we're so sorry, we'll send it right now. And they did. They started the procedure the day we negotiated that they should really use the juice to make the evaporated pomegranate juice. It turns out it's very effective. Or if you really like pomegranates, they're a little complicated to eat, but you can have a whole afternoon of just opening up a pomegranate and enjoying them one seat at a time. Methyl cofactors, B-complex, sufficient to keep your urine sunshine yellow. Most people's urine is glass clear, and that's a sign of B-complex deficit. Your well-hydrated urine should always be sunshine yellow. We want you to take in the beneficial biodetoxification of whole greens. You can make these into smoothies if you want. We prefer fresh. By the time you powder most greens, they don't taste very good 
because the air has oxidized and damaged them. So we'll show you how to make it whole at home. Now, for many of us, this was a makeover in our kitchen, but I wouldn't go back. And you want to have the high sulfur foods that are biodetoxifying. So if you say, what's the first line of biodetoxification? I would say ascorbate and polyphenolics. What's the second line? I would say high sulfur foods. And if you look at the image, you see garlic, ginger, onions, sprouts, and eggs. When we have garlic, each person gets a whole bulb of garlic, which we roast, and it comes out like custard. Ginger, a thumb-sized piece of ginger, not just a little sprinkle of some ginger powder, a thumb-sized piece of ginger minced into whatever curry or meal you're making. Onions, I prefer shallots. That's a cook's choice. Organic, of course. In regard to greens, look outside. You know, I go outside and I take some of the lettuce and some of the beet greens and some of the rosemary and some of the other things, whatever is thriving at that moment in the garden. And usually I actually saute them with a little Celtic sea salt and a little splash of apple cider vinegar and um, have them. But sometimes, as you see in the glass, you can make your own fresh green smoothie. And we do have a plant-based meal that we spent a lot of time to develop. It's nutritious and delicious, but most importantly, it, for most people, it replaces one meal a day, and most of us are overfed yet undernourished. And I hadn't measured the sixth, which is the lower right on the slide, and that's the omega-3 EPA DHA. If you talk to most physicians interested in nutrition, They'll say it's all about calories and omega-3, omega-6. Well, you know, who cares? No. <laughs> we need a balance of both. We need both omega-3 and omega-6, and we need usually to supplement with fish oil distilled under nitrogen. Because if you try to purify fish oil, which you should do because, you know, the fish came out of the ocean. There's a lot of schmutz in the ocean. So you want to distill the fish oil, but you want to do that under nitrogen to protect it. So now you concentrate the good, you remove the bad, and you have, a, in the best case, a mycelized soft shell, something that has higher bioavailability because they're little tiny droplets. So yes, you can have sardines and or fatty deep water fish as part of your diet. I encourage you to do that. Um, however, when we look at the omega-3 index, which is Bill Harris's test of balance of omega-3 and omega-6, after supplementation, most people normalize, and before supplementation, only about 2% of people have enough omega-3 on their own. So supplementation with omega-3 fish oils distilled under nitrogen is now an obligation. It's now a requirement for continued good health. If you have 10% of your calories from omega-6, which many people do from processed and packaged uh, foods, um, you are inducing repair deficit. You are inducing the very problems that we're talking about solving. So you need both, but you need a balance, and most people need more EPA, DHA. Um, and by the way, leave the krill in the ocean. Leave the algae to produce DHA, but you need both. It turns out you need DHA for brain and body, you need EPA for body and brain, you need both. And I know that you could line up, you know, 50 different experts and get 50 different opinions, but that really means we're still learning. And what I've learned is to respect nature, nurture, and wholeness. So for BioDetox Superfoods, GGOBE is the acronym. This gives you your sulforaphane and your IP6 and a variety of minerals. And when I say eggs, I mean duck eggs, goose eggs, quail eggs, and or biodynamic chicken eggs, if you can find one. But you know that eggs, basically foods, are based on whatever either the animal or the soil provided. So if you start with toxic food, you end up with toxic products in the eggs. Perfectly logical. Jim Duke, again of sainted memory, for many years was the Department of Agriculture's organic guy. Anybody who wanted to know about the science of organic foods would talk to Jim. And he published 
extensively and brilliantly. Um, however, when you say the food industry today in America, you're talking about what's called the packaged goods industry. If you talk to Kellogg, General Foods, General Mills, ADM, or, uh, you know, or uh, Cargill, they will tell you they're in the packaged foods business. They just happen to package things that have calories. The transition from our current overly processed and contaminated food supply to a healthy food supply is a big lift. And just as an example, just one small example, America will spend this year about $3.3 trillion on disease care, or if you call it health care. Tom Harkin used to say we have a great sick care system where we're looking for a health care system. When you look carefully, you find out that one out of three dollars, over a trillion dollars, is spent to shorten the life, increase the suffering, and terminate early that individual. I want to know who's in favor of that. The lobbyists, you know, the, the, the people who advocate for those dollars have their point of view, which they're welcome to, but the facts the Dartmouth Atlas facts, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that Don Berwick started at Harvard. The facts are in. We, we know what to do, but we do not yet have the will, the will from you, the will from me, the will from people, people who will go and vote. Uh, we do not yet have the will to make that, to speed that transition. So what I'm involved with among others, is to speed the transition from sick care to health care and policy practice and research. And this presentation is one of the practical expressions of that. Now, for those of you who are interested in the intoxication level of your clients, you can look in the urine. And the urine can be measured for D-glucaric acid, mercapturic acid, which sounds like it has to do with mercury, but it has to do with sulfur sulfate in the urine, hippurate in the urine. These are four intrinsic detoxification pathways. Each one has meaning. If one is inhibited and the others compensate, that's OK. But if one is down and the others are not compensating, now you are on the way to understanding the cause of their chronic ill health. And then the depenicillin provocation that I mentioned for essential and toxic minerals. Um, it was 1987 when we validated the depenicillin protocol, and we've been continuing to add to that database ever since. I mentioned the importance of fully buffered, fully reduced ascorbate. Need for vitamin C varies more widely than any other nutrient based on your total oxidative toxic burden. And so the intake of ascorbate is proportionate to oxidative stress and repair or growth needs. And we want to enhance safer toxic mineral removal. The sea cleanse determines burden and need. There is no fixed dose that everybody needs. And very often people will do studies on a half a gram or a gram or two grams, and they will say high dose vitamin C was used and we gave two grams. They should come talk to us. Now, kidney function, of course, is very important. The most sensitive test of kidney function is specific gravity. So if you go 12 hours without drinking, so 12 hours NPO, the urine should be concentrated at greater than 1.020. So yes, you can do EGFR, you can do BUN and creatinine, but they are less sensitive, less predictive than an old-fashioned specific gravity. So nature's central protective antioxidant also gets the toxins out. So ascorbate not only helps regenerate you, helps stimulate your connective tissue and wound repair, but ascorbate also chaperones. It wraps around. It actually chelates. It wraps around the toxic metal and helps remove it without redepositing it. How do you do the C-cleanse? If you're healthy, you use half a teaspoon, which is a gram and a half, every 15 minutes. That's six grams in an hour. If you're moderately ill, twice as much, 
3 grams or a full teaspoon every 15 minutes, 12 grams an hour. And many people do better when they start with 2 teaspoons or 6 grams every 15 minutes, 24,000 milligrams in an hour. Most people will cleanse within an hour or two. <laughs> Very often people are hesitant, so they want to start at a half a teaspoon and they'll do that every 15 minutes for a couple of hours and they could go on for the rest of the day. What we suggest is decide where you are. Are you in a high level of health? Are you moderately unwell? Are you chronically unwell? And follow the guidance. If you want to revise it, this is something I learned and I actually advocate for. Practice the rules very, very well before you break them. That's a quote from my daughter's godfather, who's the Dalai Lama. I'll tell you the story some other time about how that happened. Uh, we want to pump toxins out more safely. A gram of ascorbate which is actually a million micrograms, and we often talk about micrograms in regard to toxic metals. Your daily toxic mineral exposure is about 20 micrograms, total toxic minerals. So the first two grams of vitamin C, of nature's ascorbate that you take, is just to chaperone out the bad stuff you took in. It's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the food. You know, you don't have to go look for it, it'll find you. So after six hours of rest, if your urine pH is less than 6.5, you have metabolic acidosis and magnesium deficiency at the cellular level until proven otherwise, and it's almost always the case. If you are healthy and you have enough magnesium and choline citrate, then your urine pH will be 6.5 to 7.5. If it's over 7.5 consistently, that's catabolic illness. Many people, after trauma or surgery, are in a catabolic state where they tear down their muscle and protein just to survive. They're in survival mode, and we want to shift them back to high-level health mode. The D-penicillamine, you start on the morning of the second day to collect a 24-hour urine. You continue for the third day because some people pour so much toxic metal out that we want to protect them on the third day. And we talked about kidney function tests and specific gravity and how valuable that can be. This is the D-penicillamine pharmacology part for any of you who are uh, into pharmacology. As you see on the right side of your slide, you could call this mercaptovaline. It's like valine with a sulfur on it. Or you could call it more water-soluble cysteine, dimethylcysteine. And we get to methylation. So it chelates divalent cations all, both essential and toxic. It stimulates nitric oxide. I don't know how avid you are to stimulate nitric oxide, but I'm a big fan of nitric oxide. It increases sulfur phase two detoxification, and it's synergistic with phase one and phase two combined detoxification. It is safe. There's no cross-reactivity with penicillin. It doesn't come from penicillin. It hasn't since 1950. And so there's a lot of misinformation about a lot of these issues that we try to clarify and provide you the evidence uh, to support that um, we've, we've done our homework so that you can rely on us. Now, this is a report, happens to come from a lab, <clears throat> and the young lady allowed me to show it. And what you see with the red circle is that lead and mercury um, don't look too bad until you look on the right and you see they really are outside the reference range. If you look at the two red arrows, barium and uranium are also elevated. Now, barium today, about the only way you would get barium is through a radiologic procedure. Uranium, on the other hand, you can find that in the strangest of places. And even if it's stable, it's still a very big molecule that is not your, your kidneys don't like it. So this is now a very personal story. What you see is my tooth that was filled in the late 1960s with a root canal that just within the last year, no, now going back, say two years, cracked. And I hope on this picture you can see that there's a crack. What I also have to confide in you is that there was enough mercury left after half a century to cause a neurotoxic reaction in my cerebellum. And while I'm recovering from it, 
I now have a renewed conviction to get the bad stuff out, especially the toxic metals. Amalgams, as you know, contain mercury and problems. There are many with that. Porcelain crowns often have aluminum, other problems with that. Um, it was this organization that acquainted me with the fact that you could use gutta percha if you needed to do a root canal. And there are many, um, there are many mineral complexes that are used in dental materials that affect electricity, biological electricity, called galvanism. Not a big part of this presentation, but I'd be happy to talk to any of you who are interested in that issue of piezoelectricity and its role in health and wound repair. So metal-free dentistry, is there really such a thing as truly metal-free? Or do you just use the metals that the person is compatible with? That's what we suggest. Mercury, well, we've actually done some fairly extensive studies. Uh, I mean the American uh, ATSDR, the, the toxicology studying people, the EPA, National Academy of Sciences. They studied more than 60,000 newborns with developmental impairment on the Faroe Islands that showed that low-level mercury during pregnancy caused adverse consequences for the product, for the, ch for the child. There was a study in the Seychelles that did not reach significance. Some people criticize its method. About 20% of the population has a central nervous system, plus or minus renal damage, just from mercury. And bioaccumulation or bioconcentration can occur at 200,000 to 10 million fold. So taking in a little bit of something that comes in and stays and depletes you over time will wear you down and wear you out. Now, this I learned from Bill Ray. One part per million means 20,000 mercury molecules per cell. I'd like to have as close to zero mercury molecules in my cell. I, there's no value in having mercury in your cell. So when we talk, when people say, oh, it's only one ppm or it's only a few ppm, you're really, at the cellular level, talking about a big problem and a growing problem. Physiology of mercury includes cognitive impairment and headaches, fatigue and joint pain, dizziness, anxiety and depression, autoimmune disease, metallic taste in the mouth, peripheral neuropathy, including numbness, tingling in feet and hands. These are so common that if you just tap people on the shoulder in this property, you'd find a significant fraction of them would have one or more of these signs, physiologic signs, of too much bad and not enough good, and particularly the toxic metals. So mercury, how much mercury? A hundred tons of mercury is gifted to the United States every year from the Sahara. It turns out they use mercurial fungicides and biocides that get picked up by the tiny sand granules, get carried up into the high atmosphere, and come all the way across the ocean and deposit all the way along the East Coast from Maine down to the Caribbean. And if you are west of the Mississippi, you're not exempt because another 100 tons comes from Asia. When you look at 100 tons, 2,000 pounds per ton, and do the math, the average American has 302,666 micrograms per year available as their allocation. You're just dividing the number of people into the total mercury. On the right side, you see that at 302,666, in 50 years, you'd have over a million micrograms. The synergy among toxic minerals may be a hundredfold. So I've heard people say, oh, there's only a little bit of lead, a little bit of mercury, a little bit of cadmium, a little bit of arsenic. Well, they're not additive. They're multiplicative. So the mercury binding constant to active selenium is 10 to the 40th. That's very high. So when mercury sees selenomethionine, or when mercury sees selenium containing essential nutrients, the mercury binds to that and inactivates it. Too much bad, not enough good. And then, in case that wasn't enough, from coal combustion and medical waste, 
another one and a half million micrograms per person per lifetime. And where do we get it from medical waste? Well, do you know that many people still have amalgams in their mouth? I know that's going to shock you, but they, they do. And do you know that when people pass, they don't take the mercury out? Okay. In memory of Jess Clifford, I show you this picture of our butterfly bush. And this is part of our permaculture biodynamic food forest that I mentioned. You see the fence. So this is Fort Jaffe in the Vienna woods. And the only reason for that wire fence is we don't mind the little critters. We don't even mind the raccoons and, 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 and their litter. But the deer, they'll bring their friends. <laughs> And we planted, you know, deer unfriendly plants and they stepped over those. Okay, so the reason for the fence is the deer, but Jess Clifford was a dear human being to many of you closer even than to me, but I had great admiration for Jess and his family. Jerry, the son, has been extremely helpful to us as we have been revalidating and making available very soon the Clifford method exactly as they did it. Um, and it's, it's a, a tribute to Jess, what he accomplished, uh, and it's our privilege to carry it forward, and I sure appreciate Rich Fisher's friendship and guidance over the years, but also his kind of introductory words. Oh, the video did work. Can you see the butterflies? It's not too long, and it should fly off in just a minute, but it's a butterfly bush, and so I wanted you to see butterflies. Ah, there, there you go. One of those might have been Jess, who knows? Okay. <laughs> Now, in regard to Clifford testing, you probably have seen this because it's his slide. The form of metals is more important than the presence. The compo composites turn out to be important. Um, we have gone back and validated every one of the items that the Clifford method tests for, and God bless Jess, he did a very good job. So it's not quite the LRA test. It is what you see here. It's a conventional ELISA. Indications include hormone or liver or renal issues, atopic dispositions, people who are environmentally sensitive or universal reactors, highly sensitive individuals, high cost and complex restoration products, and galvanically active. That means electrically active. So be careful about inducing an electrical current that will compete with, excuse me, that will compete with what you're trying to accomplish. Now there are lots of studies if you want to get into the details of how much bad and how much good. For example, in 100 years, industrial chemicals increased by 1,500% in pregnant women's, um, this is uh, umbilical cord blood. And all pregnant women averaged 43 plus xenotoxins that would not have been present in 1900, but are present today. What are the consequences of this? Well, more studies are needed. And I'm saying while we're waiting for the studies, we should enhance the good and get, get the bad out. So stop fighting with disease, start restorative detoxification, safer detoxification in three phases to make things more water soluble and easier to excrete. Phase one has to do with metabolism, phase two conjugation, and phase three is lipotropic. We pioneered in the late 80s a, a, a triple detoxifier, phase one, phase two, phase three. We still make it available because if your bile is more soluble, your liver is happier and it's able to get schmutzy stuff out. And then if you have the prebiotic fiber in your intestines, you bind the toxins to the fiber and now you have a healthy digestive transit time and you get them out without reabsorption. The D-penicillamine, we talked about pharmacokinetics are favorable, both for ascorbate and D-penicillamine. Therapeutic use of safer biodetoxification, I think is ready for prime time. Provoked D-penicillamine is an option to quantify essential and toxic minerals. So biologic garlic, ginger, onions, brassica sprouts and eggs, GGOBE, with pulse D-penicillamine as needed. Now, if you use D-penicillamine therapeutically, as it says clearly in the protocol, only twice a week. In Yiddish, that would be Muntik and Donishtik, which means Monday and Thursday. 
The reason that you give it one day and then stop for two days is because if you give penicillamine every day, you eventually inhibit the collagen and elastin cross links and, that's, and you induce autoimmune problems. Many people know not to do that. What we found was if you give penicillamine pulsed on two days and the other five you do not take penicillamine, the cross links form just fine, you get the benefit of the D-Pen detoxification, and you don't interfere with collagen elastin cross-linking. Now, when we talk about the phase two detoxification, that has a lot to do with cysteine, methionine, glutathione, and methylation. By the way, methylation is in. It's one of those words that's kind of in the zeitgeist right now. I was talking to someone who said, have you heard, doctor, about methylation? I said, well, here's an article I wrote 24 years ago about how important methylation is. Uh, is that what you mean? <laughs> you can add the key later like depenicillamine if needed, but biological detox works very well. If you look at the bottom of the slide, it says side effects from depen are rare, true. Any issue surfaces, by all means, stop and call us. Reevaluate the clinical circumstance. If you want our consultation, I have a team of people who's just waiting for your call. When we talk about depenicillamine dental material testing, we also want to uh, emphasize the opportunity to do LRA tests, that's the other side of what we have been offering for a long time, for delayed hypersensitivity, including metal hypersensitivity and environmental chemical hypersensitivity. And the combination of the Clifford test and the LRA by ELISA Act are like peanut butter and jelly or something like that. Magnesium, I haven't said enough about magnesium, so I must emphasize magnesium. Healthier detoxification and an effective removal of toxins requires phase one detoxification, which in turn requires magnesium. Magnesium is a mineral that activates hundreds of catalysts in your body. If you want your ATP to work, you need one molecule of magnesium for every ATP molecule. If you want to get the bad stuff out or block the toxic metals from coming in, you need enough magnesium in your diet and in your intestines. If you want to have glutathione, you need magnesium to help synthesize it because glutathione is always made inside the cells. Taking supplemental glutathione turns out to be a very expensive form of taking an amino acid. Deficiency can cause lead or cadmium accumulation. So when magnesium is low, the body is so hungry for magnesium that it will take up the toxic metals in order to get the limited magnesium in the diet. When you follow the magnesium enhancement using first morning urine pH and magnesium choline citrate, as we have done for 25 plus years, you find you can correct the problem and they genuinely notice, feel, and function the difference and praise you. So magnesium uptake is enhanced with choline citrate. Most of us lack the ability to take up magnesium, so we need choline citrate. We advocate 220 milligrams four times a day. That's a total of 880 milligrams of elemental magnesium. If you use the choline citrate, the magnesium comes in and stays in. If you don't use the choline citrate, they will get diarrhea and run away from you. So magnesium displaces toxic minerals and protects fats. It turns out it's a protective, protector for essential fats when they're in LDL transport. Choline becomes acetylcholine. That's a soothing neurotransmitter. Also, it makes for cholinergic bile, which is more soluble, and citrate energizes and alkalinizes, and so the alkaline way is enhanced when you use magnesium choline citrate. This is a chart we make available in our uh, Joy of Living the Alkaline Way Guide or on its own. It's been in several textbooks. It's in the National Natick Nutrition Guide. It says to you on the right of your slide, you see the alkaline forming, more alkaline foods, you want 80% if you're recovering to be, 80% uh, on your plate, 80% of what you see on your plate. You don't have to count anything. Just look at your plate. 80% should be from the alkaline side, 20% from the acid side. And when you're healthier, 60-40. So you still need a little excess of alkaline. So we have together in the last slightly more than an hour uh, done our best to help you understand immune system functions in healthy circumstances and in chronic illness about host hospitality and vulnerability to impaired wound healing and susceptibility to infection and how to prevent that, why inflammation really is repair deficit, and why the toxins of today that you see in practice are just the tip of a very big iceberg that affects all of civil society. 
So we want to have compatibility and tolerance in our dental materials and in our food chemical choices. We want to be able to repair and detox safely and effectively, starting with the four self-assessments, moving on to the eight predictive biomarkers. And we reviewed 100,000 tests to cover all of epigenetics. It comes down to eight tests, some of which are familiar, some of which are not. But we interpret them to best outcome goal value, not interpret them to uh, uh, reference ranges. The ranges that the lab provides you are for statistical purposes only. If you take care of statistics, look at that range. If you take care of people, don't even look at it. In fact, I recommend that you fold that under when you're discussing with the patients their results and you point out whether they are or are not at their best outcome value, having nothing to do with making them a statistic. So it's been my pleasure to be back. As I said, I come in peace. Uh, we are thrilled and delighted to be able to offer you the Clifford Method along with the other things we do. Keeps me off the streets and out of trouble. And hopefully I'll have the pleasure of coming back again soon.